Road to Cinema has extended the final draft screenwriting software giveaway. All you have to do is follow us on Twitter, at Jog Road, like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Jog Road, or subscribe to our YouTube channel, Jog Road Productions, for your chance to win a free voucher to purchase final draft screenwriting software, brought to you by Road to Cinema and the team at Final Draft. Welcome to episode number 30 of the Road to Cinema podcast, featuring director and screenwriter Rupert Gould of the new film True Story, starring Jonah Hill, James Franco, and Felicity Jones. The film tells the true story of Michael Finkel, played by Jonah Hill, a journalist for the New York Times. When Michael's world is thrown into a tailspin, After he's fired from the New York Times for falsifying sources in an article, he's contacted by the recently arrested Christian Longo, played by James Franco, a man who has been accused of murdering his entire family. And he's been impersonating Michael as he's been trying to avoid arrest. As Michael begins writing a book about Christian, Michael comes to realize that the truth and lies behind his identity and Christian's may be more ambiguous than he originally thought as both Michael and we as an audience both question the guilt and innocence of Christian Longo. For more information on the Road to Cinema podcast, to read the Road to Cinema blog, and to watch our Road to Cinema YouTube series, please visit jogroadproductions.com. You can follow us on Twitter, at jogroad, for the latest updates. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash jogroad or subscribe to our YouTube channel. And now we join director and screenwriter Rupert Gould as he discusses his inspiration behind making his new film, True Story, which opens in theaters on April 17th. You know, it wasn't necessarily the kind of film I, that I anticipated making first off, but I think that uh, on a, two things happened. One, on a personal level, um, my my brother lost his job in the recession around 2009, which was just before I began to pick up the first version of the script on this, and, uh, you know, he had three young children and was, like a lot of people, was uh, based in redundancy at that period and, and spent about six months out of work, I think, and so weirdly I felt like I had been living with different versions of Longo and Finkel in a way, because you know, obviously Finkel loses his job and uh, Longo struggles with the dependency of his three young children and family, and uh, uh, I think sort of personally that the stories of, of, of both men kind of spoke to me at some level. Uh, but but also I, I think um, obviously this kind of weird place where between sort of fiction and reality is it, it, something that I think is a very live issue now, and sort of documentaries are becoming more fictional, and and movies and TV shows are becoming more more real, and. Uh, many kind of boundary lines get crossed there and you look at things like, I guess, serial and jinx or whatever and, and you feel, and I feel that society is very interested in that the idea that truth and, and lies are, are less sort of absolute terms than we we used to think they were. Um, so so, I, so that, that kind of fascinated me. Yeah, no, it's uh, interesting in the film, it's almost as if um, objectivity, you know, really doesn't exist anymore. You can sort of, as, you know, Jonah Hill's character, Michael Finkel does in the film, he sort of stretches facts and manipulates them for his own uh, particular agenda. And yeah. so does Christian Lago, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I think we, you know, we make sense of the world by telling stories about it. And sometimes those stories are very accurate and sometimes they're totally made up and sometimes they're somewhere in between. And uh, both men tell the story they feel is right for them. Um, and, 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 yeah, and lose... I mean, I mean it, it, the film is about that, but then it's also about the fact that there probably is something outside moral relativism, that there are crimes which are sort of objectively evil or wrong. Um, and, you know, I think I'm interested, I suppose, in that the journalistic tradition is to give psychological and social context to, you know, often very difficult or unspeakable acts and I was interested in the film also saying, well, actually, there isn't always a why. And, and sometimes the pursuit of understanding of why people do things is actually defeating. And, uh, uh, you know, particularly in, you know, I found in Europe, we've had this recently with the, things like the Charlie Hebdo massacre, you know, sort of what, what is driving these young men to be radicalized, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, I, I, I don't have a problem with saying, don't 
don't look for explanations. Be, be unafraid of condemning the deed. I was curious, too, about uh, sort of the research process for you. Uh, did you go beyond Michael Finkel's book, or were you also sort of looking yourself in terms of different areas that you could find to uh, pull details from in both writing the script and then eventually directing? Uh, obviously, we started with the book, but then, uh, yeah, we, we went to court transcripts and uh, subsequent articles that Finkel wrote, uh, and, uh, you know, I went out to Oregon, to Newport, to, you know, to the scenes of crime, effectively, and talked to some people who'd been near it. I mean, obviously, people were kind of reluctant to give too much away, um, but... Uh, yeah, so, so, so it was very important to kind of draw on stuff as well as Mike's book, but uh, but it is you know it is a yeah, it is a true story in it, and it's an account of something that happened, a very very strange story that happened. But it, but also it is a for me it was like a parable in a way, like a kind of a strange kind of creepy, unsettling little um, story about contemporary society, and and there becomes a point as a filmmaker where you have to just treat it as a movie with its own its own tone and its own rules. Um, and uh, so the kind of research goes out the window in, the, in that late phase. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, The you know, Jonah Hill, James Franco, uh, a lot of their scenes are very contained, uh, a lot of them in that visitation room in the prison. Did you have a lot of time to rehearse those scenes or were a lot of those moments uh, discovered on the set as you were shooting? Uh, we, most of it was on the set, actually. Uh, it's sort of, it's all, I mean, given I've got a background in theater, I, I actually find rehearsals for camera slightly, um, like I somehow how the energy gets leaked out. So what I was very clear on what I was interested in in those scenes and the, and the, the detail of the beats and, and we, we shot a lot of stuff and, you know, I was doing a lot of directing and throwing a lot of thoughts in and the guys were, were, were brilliant at responding. And they were, they were long days, those ones that we shot in the, in the, the interrogation room. But, but it was mostly on camera responding to what they were both doing rather than uh, 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 in a rehearsal room, anyway. Yeah, uh, I'm curious too. As far as your, you know, you you have such a, a deep experience uh, directing for the stage. Uh, was there anything initially that you felt? Was there any learning curve you felt uh, stepping into a, a film setting in terms of, uh, you know, how you would execute the script, being on set, and even into the editing process? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, they're very different things. The stage, I mean. Uh, the things that you can carry over are, uh, uh, you know, obviously working with actors, working with with script. Uh, 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 I think, you know, if you spend the amount of time in theatres that I've done, then you kind of, you get used to pacing and kind of feeling an audience's tension and being gripped or, or slackening. Uh, where, where it's different, your whole sort of, whole tempo of your day is different. Like every, every second pretty much on a, on a film shoot, you are you are harvesting, you, you know, you can't waste an hour because everything you gather is going to be in the movie, hopefully. Whereas on stage, you're trying to, like making a kind of snowball or something, you're gathering, gathering, gathering stuff, um, and, and then you're relying on it all delivering on the night. Uh, but th- those are almost like different mindsets for a director. Um, also, the acting is different, you're kind of looking for uh, inspiration and truth and... Um, something very unfettered and immediate on screen, whereas on stage you're trying to build an architecture for the actor to be able to repeat the performance every every night, which we said, which is a different process. Um, so, they're, so they're different forms, but uh, but both kind of uh, really enjoyable in different ways. You know, I'm, I'm really lucky to to be able to do both. Yeah, um, I'm curious too about the you know the performances in the film. I feel are, are very very strong. And, um, you know, you said that you really didn't have a rehearsal process and you were discovering a lot uh, on the set uh, for the most part. Uh, was there anything initially sort of in the characterizations uh, that James Franco and Jonah Hill were bringing that um, you wanted it all to be specific to the actual people? Yes, I think that uh, it's funny. I think that there are two kinds of acting direction. Um, some directors bring a sort of methodology, like this is how I, these are my processes, I rehearse this way, I use these tools, I, whether it's Stanislavski or what a language you're talking about, or improvisation, whatever. And then I think what is more common is going, I respond to the energy of the individual actor and that some actors may need a lot of this kind of work, but other actors may need something completely different. And I 
think, you know, James... Well, James has a, has a, a sort of brilliant remoteness. He's such a mystery, James. Uh, you know, as, as a man, I think people don't know whether he's focused on being a, a filmmaker or, a, or an artist or a, a, you know, a, 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 an actor or... A, you know, he seems to have so many different things in his life. And I, I think you feel that on his on, on screen with him. He's sort of got a an unknowability, which I find really fascinating and was really great for Longer because it's very true of Longer as well. Um, and he also had an innate charisma, which is also true of Longer. Um, whereas Jonah, what I thought Jonah brought, which was even, apart from the cast in some ways, is he's sort of innately vulnerable. There's something, you know, you could look at Mike Finkel and go, you know, people often don't like journalists anyway. Uh, you know, he, he, he lies. He arguably is willfully, morally blind at moments during the story. But I think Jonah has this sort of very moving quality that you just sort of root for him. And, and that was very useful on, on, on that side of the film as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of my uh, favorite scenes uh, that I think, you know, James Franco really, uh, you know, sort of manipulated the audience in a sense was that, you know, the court testimony. I don't want to uh, give away too much uh, people listening, but, um, you know, the way he was able to deliver that and, and drive sympathy was uh, was really fascinating. Was that the was that taken from actual court transcript that uh, that testimony? Highly uh, verbatim, uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's really. <clears throat> you know, remember in the development of the film, it, that's like nearly. I think it must be getting on for almost ten minutes of film time, and we talked a lot about well, should we do flashbacks and should we show this in a different way? And I said, listen, I think if James can do this, the performance will hold this. And, uh, and I remember the funny thing with James is we'd done the first three days of shooting with him. He hadn't said a word because it had been structured that way. It was all sequences where we see, see him rather than that we hear from him. And then, and then we did that testimony. And I remember the night before saying, like, you think you've got it all there. I mean, he and I had worked. That, that was one that we had rehearsed, actually. We'd spent a couple of sessions in L.A. working on it. And he was really, really relaxed. And then when we came to shoot it the next morning... And he did the whole thing, word perfect, the first take. I mean, he was just like a machine, and uh, it was spellbinding. I mean, you'd feel the crew wanted to applaud. Well, yeah, no, it's uh, it was beautifully acted. And I'm curious, did you shoot that from, were you trying to get a lot of coverage on that, or did you know because it was something that would take so much out of him that you would just shoot it very economically? Uh, we were pretty multi-camera on, on that, because that, I, I knew he couldn't do it. Yeah, we wouldn't get much more than five goes tops on it before, before he would begin to lose um, freshness on it. I mean, because it was so long as well. So we were, I think we were all camera on, the, on those days. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think it's very cleverly shot by, by the um, DOP as well. Uh, so you know, if he hadn't known it as well as he had, and if we, we hadn't done all that work, then we would have been screwed, I think. But because he had, we actually got it pretty efficiently. Yeah. Uh, you know, being uh, your first feature film, uh, what was your experience uh, working with the DP, the cinematographer, and was there anything that you discovered that you think you would sort of carry on to uh, another feature film that you would make down the road? Well, I'd, I, I'd done a couple of Shakespeare films for the BBC, so I'd, I'd actually spent nearly yeah, almost three months behind the camera in the preceding year. So I, so I, had, I had kind of, we were some great photographers, actually, and... Uh, so I'd, I'd learned a bit from that, but the, the, the one thing I think that being, I guess, an experienced theatre director taught me is yeah, that, that the key relationship in theatre is between the, the director and the designer. The designer is like the equivalent to the DOP, I guess, on, on stage. And when you start out as a theatre director, you, you'll say, OK, for this play, I kind of want two gold staircases and a pool of blood or something. Uh, and then the more experience you get, you start saying, look, for me, this play is about um, shame and... Uh, a certain kind of male guilt or whatever. And then you trust the people you hire to interpret that because that's why you hire them. You know, you, you hire a designer to bring their own genius. And so I think with what Massa and I did when we were working on True Story is we just talked an enormous amount about each scene, its psychology, what the tone of it was, what the story we were telling, like what was happening between the characters. And we spent, like, I guess, at least half our prep time doing that rather than saying, this is the lens, this is the shot. Uh, and then I trusted him because I think he's a really wonderful, wonderful um, colleague uh, to interpret some of that. And then, I, I, then once he'd then come up with a structure for it, 
that's when I sort of fed, fed back more technically. But most of the time, I agreed with what he was proposing. Yeah. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to know if there was any particular moment in the film that you felt, uh, seeing it when it was all put together, that you felt was sort of uh, uh, beyond your expectations of when you originally conceived it. Uh, gosh, I, I... Yeah, I think that there are a couple of scenes we shot that turned out better than I could have hoped, I guess, partly to do with performance, partly just to do with technical things. Uh, uh, like, for example, James in the courtroom. Uh, but the... I guess what I had... You know, the, the stuff between James and Jonah we shot in the last week, I think. And... You know, I'd worked with them independently, and of course I knew they knew each other from, like, way back. <laughs> but their, the particular nature of their relationship as people began to bleed into some of those scenes and, and give them a kind of intimacy and a, a kind of warmth, weirdly, that I hadn't fully anticipated. I think it's actually really effective for the film.